those of you who have just joined us, welcome. Just a quick reminder, please, everyone, switch your phones and devices to silent. Quick housekeeping, uh, please try and wait till the end if you, uh, if you need a toilet or need to move or whatever. There are toilets on the left-hand side. Uh, if you do need to go, please try not to disturb anyone. Okay, so we are welcoming Ma Matthias Lux, is that how I pronounce it? From Deliveroo. Now, Deliveroo hold a, a very special place in my heart uh, for, for a, a variety of reasons. I'm a keen Deliveroo user. Uh, but I also applied for a job uh, during lockdown as a, as a delivery rider. Uh, they didn't accept me. They said, we've got too many riders in your area. But I did end up riding through Breed, so I do understand a little bit about what goes into the whole process. And I also have my eye on your bags that you've got in your display downstairs. <laughs> so if one of them goes missing, it's definitely not me. Anyway, enough about me. Uh, Matthias Lux is a senior staff data scientist for delivery, where he focuses on improving analysis methods for experiments, as well as observational data. Most recently, he has developed and implemented a model of consumer behavior that allows for more personalized targeting of Deliveroo's consumer campaigns. Okay, Matthias, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'll, I'll be talking about today is not this, hopefully. <laughs> oh, not this either. I'm trying to talk about this. Yes, measuring churn in online experiments. Um, and and as, as you heard in the introduction, this is sort of a little bit of what I've been working on for a long time, and it's part of a much bigger sort of, um, call it a model. I don't like that expression very much, but like it's more of an approach to, to how we measure certain things, um, especially in the consumer space, in the customer space, uh, not on the writer side. Um, and, and I want to talk about how to do this with, uh, with churn. Um, it says measuring churn in online experiments. Uh, the end of the talk will talk a tad about how we use that measure in online experiments, but I will be talking a lot more about churn. Um, I find churn super fascinating, and I'll tell you in a second why I think it's super fascinating at Deliveroo. Um, I also, sort of as a warning, will use churn and retention interchangeably. It's sort of, the way I think about it, two sides of the same coin. Uh, if you know one, you kind of, or measure one, you kind of know the other. So please don't hold me to the choice of vocabulary here, at least not with respect to this. Um, okay, cool. So, so one of my, um, the way I started this whole, this whole project is sort of this very strong belief that the business model that you, within the context of which we all work as data scientists, should strongly inform the design of the metrics we choose. And um, I'll try to explain this a little bit. What I think here about the business model matters, at least in the context of, of measuring customer data, is sort of, you can think of this as like two dimensions. There's the type of customer relationship you have. It can be contractual or it can be non-contractual. And there's sort of the purchase occasions you see your customers having, right? Some of the purchase occasions are predictable and others are completely unpredictable. What, I mean, what do I mean by that? Contractual, predictable, lower left-hand corner, easiest context for for everybody. Netflix is sort of my go-to example. I'm a huge user, huge fan of that. But it isn't restricted to the tech space. It could be totally insurance policies. Why are they over there? With Netflix, you have to sign up. You sign a contract, and then you basically, every month, I think that's at least how my subscription works, every month, it's very predictable, they get money from me. Right? So you both have a contractual relationship, and all your purchase occasions are totally predictable. This is one of the best worlds to live in if you want to measure consumer behavior. Because now, anytime somebody disappears, a customer says bye-bye, they need to cancel the contract. You observe churn. Now it becomes really easy because it's an observable and you can use a vast amount of tools out there. Um, roughly, like my first go-to stuff would be survival analysis. Right? You have a clearly observed left-hand side variable and then you can bring all the machinery of survival analysis to bear to study churn. Um, I want to not so much talk about the main diagonal. Let me talk about the upper right-hand corner, which is where a lot of businesses, I think, that are quite interesting and exciting, live. It's non-contractual relationships with unpredictable purchase occasions. And in a rough sense, it's everything that sort of goes as pay as you go. Uh, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Uber's ride-sharing business, Lyft, for those who know Lyft, bold, I guess, um, uh, all live in that space. Uh, but so do a lot of traditional businesses, like your doctor's office, or your broker, or your accountant. Um, and, and what does that mean? It means that you can go to the app anytime you want, uh, there is no contract, and you just show up, you purchase, and then you go away. Either it's an app or you show up at the doctor's office. 
Um, it's also unpredictable. Uh, very few people use Deliveroo religiously every week. Uh, most people are sort of habitual users, or many people are habitual users, but when they purchase, it var varies a lot. Uh, so if somebody sort of like tends to purchase a lot and then we don't see him for a while or her, um, it's not super clear what happened, right? Like they might have gone on a hiatus, they might have even gone on vacation, um, at least back in the days when we still could easily do that. Um, or they honestly got fed up with us. They had a really bad experience and went to Uber Eats or maybe decided that takeout is just not for them and they discovered their love of cooking over the lockdown. Um, so if it's non-contractual and unpredictable, um, I argue that you cannot measure churn on its own. It has to be measured in conjunction with frequency because only if you look at two of them, the two of them jointly, can you actually make a decent statement about what churn means. Um, and hopefully the idea with the individual specific purchase frequencies uh, highlights a little bit why, why calling a customer churned if you don't account for frequency becomes really problematic. Um, so now I've made this case for actually accounting for the business model and let me talk about what that looks like if you don't do that. Um, so let's talk about sort of a simple heuristic re retention metric that we've used in experiments in particular um, in the past at Deliveroo and, and that under certain circumstances you might still want to use. Uh, heuristic retention metric does a customer reorder within 28 days. So imagine you run an a experiment and um, people are entering the experiment, uh, they see in treatment, see the new feature, and they make a purchase. And then you ask yourself, well, within that purchase, or sorry, tw within 28 days after that purchase, did they make another purchase? If they did, you call it retained. If they didn't, you call it churned. Sounds really simple. Clearly has some, some great advantages in that it's, it's super super easy to calculate. You can actually calculate it in SQL. But what does it look like if we actually run an experiment? Imagine we sort of like run this experiment for six weeks. Experiment length is six weeks, and, and it's not exactly that the length of the experiment matters. It matters more at which point after rollout do you want to make a decision or start measuring your metrics. If you do something like 28 days, you can only use the data of the first two weeks. Everybody that enters afterwards, you don't observe them anymore for 28 days, so you can't say whether they churned or didn't. Now, you could argue, well, just wait longer, but then usually the PM breathes down your neck and is like, I'm done waiting, tell me what's right. Uh, and, and that sort of is the challenge, right? It's not so much about not waiting long enough, it's about at some point you have to make a decision. So we can only use the data from customers that enter in the first two weeks. Um, it's hopefully somewhat obvious why that's why that's bad, I already explained one of the advantages is super easy to calculate, it's also really easy to explain. If your PM is one of those, your product manager, one of those people that are like really, really keen on understanding what's, what's going on, you save a lot of time using that measure. Um, but the disadvantages, in my view, far outweigh any advantages this measure has. Number one, and I already sort of alluded to this, is that you ignore most, most of the data. Um, if you do something like this and you want to run an experiment in a reasonable amount of time, uh, you'll, um, you'll have a very, very small sample. And with it come all the problems of small samples, right? Like in particular, it's not exactly very efficient. So unless the effect is very big, you'll struggle finding it in the noise of, of other behavioral problems. And, and I think, was it Susan in the, from uh, Prague Madness in the talk earlier today who mentioned that that noise is a real problem? Totally the same for us at Deliver. Um, and then the other sort of slightly more problematic issue actually is even if you want to do this, you oversample mo your most frequent customers. Um, all of the people that enter here in the first two weeks, you will have all of the frequent customers will have basically already entered your experiment. All of the infrequent ones will not, or most of them will not, because they would have come after three or four or five weeks, right? So what that means is that your sample or what, on what you calculate the sort of your experiment result will not be representative of your wider population and thus your external validity of the experiment is, is challenging to, to ensure. Now you can fix this in, in certain ways, um, but, but you, you're left with the problem that uh, you ignore most of the data and then even if you try to fix it, you don't get around the efficiency problem unless you had uh, more data. So is there a way that allows us not to throw out those four weeks of data? And it seems particularly silly if you think about the, the person that enters just like one day after the two weeks, a person that we would only observe for, for 
27 days until we want to make a decision. Clearly, there must be a way of using that kind of data. Why are we sticking to this 28-day threshold so religiously? Um, and that's sort of what I want to talk about uh, in, the, in the next part. So if we don't use heuristics, what can we do? And um, I'm, I'm one of those terrible data scientists that, uh, that really like to complicate things. Um, if the, the model gets more and more complicated, I get happier and happier. Um, now, the key is finding that happy intersection of a complicated model where I get to learn a lot and one where I can dem demonstrate business value that makes my stakeholders actually say, yeah, okay, I can, I can live with that level of complexity. And I think, or at least on that project, I certainly found that happy medium. Um, I'll fail with my next one, I'm sure. Okay, so if not heuristics, what then? Um, we'll just model the process, right? And we'll model the process, put a model on the process, and then derive something out of that model that allows us to say something about retention. What could that look like? Imagine a customer just shows up and orders on the app. Then, then our model will be super simple. We'll just assume that the next time they show up will be a random time drawn from an exponential distribution. Pull something from that distribution and say, okay, you'll show up again in 2.3 days. And then um, that's the purchase timing. And now we have to ask ourselves, are they going to stay or are they going to go? And we just use this really simple coin flip model probability model with a Bernoulli distribution where with a bias coin, they either drop out and they stay in. If they stay in, they draw again from the frequency distribution, make another purchase, and then they decide again whether or not they drop out. Super simple. And at some point, we, ran, we reached the end of the observation sample. So now we had three purchases, two repeat purchases. Time in between, we model that as a frequency distribution and the decision to drop out or not, we model that with a coin flip. Let me talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, oh, and then the one thing that I totally need to say, that's not my idea, of course. <laughs> it never is. Most of the time it isn't. Um, this paper is one that, uh, that uh, is sort of the, one of the mainstays in this whole literature of trying to, to model customers. I found it particularly useful compared to some of the other stuff, be partly because I think, and that's sort of where that happy medium comes in, it's, I think, the easiest way you can model customer purchases. It isn't necessarily the best, um, and we can have a discussion about what really good means, but it's certainly the easiest you can start with and then see how much value de you derive from that and only get more complicated if you actually need to because it doesn't work for your business. Okay, um, right. So these people are to thank, not me. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, what that... Uh, time between purchases looks like. And yes, I'm going to talk about formulas because I actually really like formulas. Um, but, uh, but I hope also to make them somewhat approachable for you. So tell me afterwards whether it worked or not. Uh, the, the, the exponential distribution, you can look that up on Wikipedia. Um, that's the PDF and the CDF. Um, it really, what it means, how I want to think about this, and it will play a role down there, is like if you think about the CDF, it really means what is the probability that the next time to the next purchase will be of a particular length? Why is that interesting? If sort of the first Im implication is that now you can start asking sort of behavioral question, right? Like, what is the probability just that a customer makes no purchase in a given time interval delta t? Well, that's the probability that the draw from the exponential distribution is greater than delta t. Oops. Um, which, if you then you know, do a bit of probability theory, and this is where the CDF comes in, is this, this expression down there. The expression by itself obviously means very little, but the interesting bit is, maybe you start seeing this, is that we can now ask all sorts of questions about customer behavior of a model like that. And then it becomes a bit of an um, uh, exercise in probability theory, how you might answer that question within the context of that model. And that's sort of where I think the power of these, these, these models comes in. Now you see a single parameter, the lambda. That isn't obviously very realistic to assume that that lambda is the same for all customers. Um, I already made the point about frequent and infrequent customers entering in different, um, in different proportions during the length of an experiment. So we'll just put, think of it as a, as a prior, maybe think of it as a um, uh, random coefficients model if that's sort of your, your statistical background or your discipline. We just throw a gamma distribution on that. And the picture down here is just to say it's a pretty flexible distribution. 
even though it's only parameterized by two parameters, r and alpha. OK, so that was a complicated bit. The dropout process was is super simple, right? Literally, it's a coin flip. It's a biased coin, p, 1 minus p, not necessarily equal, um, but it's nothing else than that. And again, we don't want every customer to have the same p, so this time we use a beta distribution. And um, again, pretty flexible uh, with respect to the distribution or possible distributions that you can map off those dropout parameters within the, within the population that you want to estimate this over. Now we've got two more parameters, a and b, for a total of four. Um, why gamma and beta? If you actually look at the paper, you'll realize that they're just chosen for mathematical convenience. One of those things where I think that's the easiest, if you want to do something much more complicated, um, you'll have to also bring more complicated machinery to, to bear to solve those things. And, um, and that may or may not pay off in your particular instance. Um, it hasn't yet for us. So, so this is plenty flexible to derive a lot of business value. Um, great. So, OK, so now we've got four parameters. And we need to estimate them somehow, right? Um, so if you, uh, again, think about what the model allows you to say about purchase behaviors, you can start mapping purchase behavior in a sample into a likelihood function. And then you can maxim use maximum likelihood to estimate those four parameters. And when you do that, you realize that there's only three data series that you really need. Um, the number of repeat purchases, two in our simple example, the total length of the period over which you observe the customer, not all of them, but the customer. So it's a customer specific duration. Um, that's sort of from the first purchase to the end of our sample, and then the timing of the last observation, recency. So you need those three, three data series for each customer. Let's call them curly X, and then you have a sample of capital N, whatever. Uh, for our case, often in the millions, sample of customers. Um, pretty simple, right? Like you've got three data series, really easy to calculate. Uh, none of the individual timings of the purchases matter in this context. That's all been partly because of the exponential distribution has all been washed out. Um, that's mathematical convenience. Um, and, and with those time series, excuse, yeah, with those data series, sorry, uh, you can estimate the four parameters. Um, the maximum likelihood optimization isn't super hard. It's just tedious to do with a lot of observations. That's, again, where simplicity has played a really big part for us. Um, right. So, OK, so now we've got this model and those four parameters. And I promised you something about retention. None of those four parameters really mean anything for retention. So what are we going to do next? Um, and as I tried to say in this, uh, when I talked about the exponential distribution and, and had that little example of the probability of no purchase in a particular interval, um, that's exactly what we're going to do now. We're just going to do it a little more complicated. The first question we have to ask ourselves, though, in a model like that, what is retention? And, um, and the way I think retention, or rather, I, it seems sensible to me, it's like a retained customer today is one that makes another purchase. Right? Like if you're a customer today, but you never purchase from me again, then you're not really that valuable to me. Um, so you can think of retention in the context of this model as a, a customer who has a prob or rather the retention measure for a customer as the probability of making at least one other purchase at some point in the future. If you read the literature on these models, that's often called like something like P alive, which is the probability of making a, at least one purchase at any time in the infinite future. So most PMs don't like to think about infinity a lot. Um, they tend to be like, well, I don't care if you buy another time in, like, in two or three years, I'm going to be bankrupt. That's too late. What are you going to do in the next quarter or in the next 28 days? So retention really becomes a question of what is the probability of making at least one other purchase in the next T weeks, next X weeks. That you don't find in the literature. So, so I sort of like noodled through some of the math myself, trying to figure out what that expression could look like. And let me talk to you, to you about that in a little bit. So the probability of making at least one purchase, like that's the number of purchases in time interval t, is larger than 0. Conditional on our data and the two parameters lambda and p. 
and I fear that the next bit will not be, oh, there we go. Yeah, you can kind of see this. Sorry, um, let me do this. So, so it's a really ugly expression. It's not quite as simple anymore. However, this was the probability of making a purchase in the next T weeks if you are still a customer with me today. So that's the bit I talked about. And then the question is, okay, if you're alive today, a customer today, what's the probability of you being alive today? Well, that's the probability of, of not making a purchase in between your last purchase, TX, and, and today, capital T, and you are alive at T, which means you didn't drop out and you made no purchase in this interval. Divided by the probability of the, the total probability of having made it to, to DX, which is the probability of making no purchase, which is the same, not having dropped out and not having made a pro, uh, purchase, plus having dropped out at TX. Know that as of your last purchase, we know you were alive, because you made a purchase. So the only thing we sort of like need to bridge over is the time between your last purchase, TX, and today, capital T. And I apologize for the, for the font not coming through very, very clearly. And that's retention. So in the way, we're done. Now, we don't estimate lambda and p. Those are customer-specific or individual-specific parameters. So, so we need to integrate out lambda and p and condition the whole thing on that set of four parameters, r, alpha, a, and b, that we were talking about before. And then you get a, an expression that looks like this. And to be honest, don't think about it. It's just like that's what you would plug into a formula to actually have a number for a customer. With, a, with an observed history of, um, of uh, curly x and a given set of parameters, that's the probability that the customer is still a customer with you or will make another purchase in the next um, T weeks. We tend to like to use 28 days. I, I personally like a quarter. But now it becomes a matter of like whatever your stakeholder is interested in, you can answer that question. Notice that that little t, or maybe you can't see this, but let me tell you, the little t only enters over here, individually and independently of everything else. So one of the really nice things about this, this approach is, I, I, I would argue, you can estimate this for six weeks, the model, and then you can make a statement about what it, what, how likely the customers will be to make another purchase in the next three months. So you can totally disentangle the duration of your estimation period and the period over which you want to make a behavioral statement. Once you have this model in place, you can make all sorts of statements. And um, they are not tied to your estimation period. Remember with our heuristic, this like observing for 28 days, all we could ever say is whether they would make another purchase within the next 28 days. If we wanted to say something like make another purchase within the next quarter, we would have waited a quarter for, for us to say anything and analyze the experiment. You don't have to do that anymore. Now, you might argue, well, you might ask yourself, how good is this in terms of predicting the purchase? It's actually very good. Um, on the data that we've been using it, with that simple specification, you get a, a MAPE um, that is sort of in the single digits percentages. And frankly, that's good enough for me. Um, I really also would argue that the real test is, can we get business value out of that? And, and so in some sense, predictive performance is interesting and indicative, but not actually determining, right? It's not definitive. Um, and uh, let me tell you, we've saved quite a bit of money with this approach compared to what we used to do. Um, right, so we've got this retention thing, PI, because it's uh, individual specific and it depends on that parameter theta, which is, I'm sorry I took that away, um, which is those four parameters, R, alpha, A, and B. Um, and now we have a retention measure. As I said, I'm going to talk a lot about churn and very little about, or in time, very little about experiments. You can use this for all sorts of offline analyses, right? Like you can use this to basically go and say, oh, if I continually observe that over time, at which point do I need to send people a reminder to, you, to purchase with us again, right? So it, it becomes sort of, it, it could, if you wanted it to be, become an input parameter, input measurement for any like voucher campaigns you have, reactivation campaigns you have. You know, you basically have a, a view on a customer's chance of churning and maybe you run some experiments to figure out at which threshold you most optimally should send something to a specific customer to, to make them not churn. Um, so, so there's like uses of this that I can, can think of that are totally independent of, of experiments. But let me tell you about 
how to use this in experiments. Um, and let's uh, take a little stock, uh, take stock for a moment again. Some of that I already told you, apologies. Um, we've got this, this, this set of parameters theta, right? Like R, alpha, A, and B. R and alpha characterize the frequency distribution, and A and B characterize the churn or dropout process. And then we've got this customer-specific retention estimate, pi theta, which was that probability. Um, a purist, which I was at the beginning of the project, um, would go and say, oh, sure, A and B is all I need to know about churn, so let's uh, run an experiment, A, like uh, treatment A, treatment, excuse me, control and variant, status quo versus the new feature, uh, we estimate those four parameters, and then we have A and B characterize our churn probability, and that's what I'm going to report. They characterize the distribution. What was it? The beta distribution. And we could say something like, okay, our measure of churn is the mean of that distribution, or the median, or any summary measure you want. And then you would have a really, really crisp churn measure. There's no, no contamination of frequency parameters, R or alpha in there. Remember that big probability um, expression I had at the bottom when we had integrated out lambda and p actually had R and alpha in them. That's what I said at the very early stage about you cannot really disentangle churn and uh, frequency. They necessarily go together and what you know about frequency influences how you, what you say about churn and vice versa. You can't estimate frequency without understanding whether customers or how how aggressively customers churn. Um, with those parameters, you could. And I thought, oh, that's awesome. I'm totally going to do that. So I ran that by a few people, and they were all like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And those were the data scientists. Um, <laughs> the PMs were like, yeah, that's not useful. I can't work with that. So that's when sort of like the customer-specific retention estimate came in. And that was something where they were like, OK, so now I understand what you're talking about. Um, Would have been nice if we could, do it, could have done it that way. Didn't really work out. So now what, you, what can you do? You have this specific parameter for each customer, um, the retention parameter, and it's really as simple as comparing means with an asterisk. You run your experiment, you split people into treatment and control, you estimate the model on treatment and on control separately because you want to capture changed customer behavior due to your feature. You don't want to estimate this on your control data from before the experiment and then make some prediction of retention because that would be assuming that they behave um, with purchase frequencies and churn the same way they did before you introduced the feature. So you don't want to do that. But if you then estimate them in the, um, for treatment and control separately and you calculate the churn measure, take the mean of that, you now have average retention in treatment, average retention in control, you can just compare the two. Caveat, don't calculate the ordinary variance because it's, it's a created data series, right? This is not observed data. It's, um, it's a function that depends on estimated parameters, and then you need to use the delta method to calculate the variance, and, and that's um, involves the whatever. Um, it's like the derivative of the, the measure and the, the theta sigma in the middle is like the variance of those parameters, right? Because they're not observed. But that's a bit of a wrinkle. Um, you can then, if you do that, calculate the same kind of t-statistic you would ordinarily compare the retention mean in treatment minus control take the square root of the variance, and because at Deliveroo, at least, we live in asymptopia, um, asymptotic arguments almost always hold, luckily. It makes life a lot easier. Um, and that should be normal zero, one. Now, in theory, that sounds really good. In practice, um, yes, normally we live in asymptopia. That model, though, puts so much additional pressure on the parameters that we don't live in asymptopia. So we end up bootstrapping the variance. Uh, that approximation hasn't worked out for me. I, I know that in other data sets, it can work out. It's just with our data, it hasn't really worked out for us. So in practice, we bootstrap the variance, then form the t-statistic, and then you still get a pretty good normal zero one distribution. Um, the problem about the bootstrap is that even though the model is conceptually pretty simple, the maximization of the likelihood for bootstrap runs, because then you do it like for the variance 200 times or so until you have a good estimate, um, and then the evaluation of the retention measure is sufficiently expensive to, to try to do a, a lot of sort of things to speed that up. And there's uh, both sort of a set of mathematical tricks you can use, and obviously the computational stuff, if you don't know 
if you, if you don't know what to do anymore, then you parallelize. That always works. Um, uh, and, and that way, you want to probably really work on the computational ex, um, expense of that if that is a problem. Um, we've done a lot of that. Maybe I should give another talk about that at some point. But that's basically what we do, how we measure retention in, in experiments. And if you made it so far, then uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope it wasn't as boring as uh, whatever these people attended must have been. Um, we hire, obviously, um, hire a lot. We try to grow a lot next year. If you have any questions about that, talk to me. We have a booth downstairs. If you have any questions about the talk, maybe we can squeeze in a few before lunch. Round of applause for Matthias. Thank you. Those people are clearly doing a hackathon. Um, so yes, yeah, so the way this works, uh, we can't give you mics because of COVID, um, but if you ask a question, Matthias will do his best to relay your question back for the benefit of the entire group and for the video um, and then answer it, okay? So, uh, first question for Matthias. Yes, chap in the front row. Okay, so the question is how we deal with seasonality in this context, because as, as the gentleman rightly said, the delivery is a really seasonal business. Um, uh, the short answer is we don't. The longer answer is that it's not a question of this model, but any metric we'd calculate is affected by that seasonality problem. So it depends a little bit on the feature people want to run in experiments, and then if it's particularly important, we would say something like, well, don't run it during the summer months. Certainly don't run it around Christmas to deal with that. Um, the reason why I say that, that sort of like that's the same problem with other metrics is because we only estimate the metric over the duration of the experiment, right? So if you were to calculate some really simple metric like order volume or profit, however you want to define this, that also would be, a season, or would be um, subject to seasonality. Um, it, there's a sort of like deeper question here. If you were to use this for offline analyses and do something like, yeah, I estimate this over three or six months, then that is certainly a problem. That's totally true. Um, there are ways of dealing with that in this framework, which I find super cumbersome and not that great. Uh, uh, what I think is an, an easier approach is to backfill your data and then have a time series of whatever you want to get out of that model and then seasonally adjust that one. Uh, I think that's a bit more successful than if you want to do it in this model. Um, if you don't have that choice, then yeah, then that's a really hard problem. <laughs> yes, Chitra, to the back. Somebody knows something. How do we incorporate plus? And um, to expand a little bit on that, I, I argued in the beginning that um, I view Deliveroo as a pay-as-you-go business, and PLUS obviously isn't, right? Those of you who know PLUS, um, uh, well, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't um, know that pl or PLUS is something that you subscribe to on a monthly basis, which then gives you um, uh, free delivery um, in its simplest form. Uh, really good question. Again, it's one of those that isn't necessarily specific to this model because we have issues with PLUS in many analyses, or like it throws a wrench into things. Um, uh, going back to what I said about, about wanting to do things super complex, um, there is a different way of these types of models that deals with subscription-based services. And what you could do is you could split people into plus and non-plus and combine the two models. You obviously, you have moving in between, and that gets really complicated. So, so I'm just weaseling out by saying, I sweep it under the rug. <laughs> Great question. Wow, you've got like a million questions. We'll do our best to get through them all. Um, right, chap at the front here. Yes, thank you. Okay, so as I said in the beginning, this is more sort of, I did never said it, but the gentleman here totally picked up on it. It's a model for repeat purchases. Um, in that I was always talking about those free, these repeat purchases, like how many, the data series was, was not how many purchases did you make, but how many repeat purchases did you make. And, and it's true that if somebody shows up once, it's extremely hard to say anything about them, because they don't show, show up again. Um, 
at the moment, the model sort of doesn't say a lot about those people. They're in there, and um, that's an obvious problem in experiments. If you run them too short, like enough people use Deliveroo sufficiently and frequently so that there is a lower bound on how short you can run an experiment to say something meaningful about your customer base. But I think the deeper learning is that if you observe somebody only once, you haven't learned anything about their behavior, honestly. Um, you could put other things on this model and make it more complicated, and there are models that try to do that, but that goes back to sort of what I said initially. We haven't quite seen the need for that yet in terms of getting value out of this approach. I'm sure that at some point we're gonna get to a point where we might have to look at these people more seriously. That's right. Okay, next question. Raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, yes, the chat there on the, on the aisle. Right, so the question is about the, the, the business impact this model can have, and if I understood that correctly, is outside of experiments. And I think the example mentioned here was, um, do we use that to influence how we match riders with specific orders to specific customers? Um, now I'm gonna go a little corporate on you. Uh, yes, there's a lot of business impact. Yes, there's a lot you can do with this model outside of, of the use of experiments. Um, but let's have another chat about what we exactly do with that. Let me, let me uh, tell you though that, that I think there are A, a lot of applications for this, and B, many of them are promising to be sufficiently interesting for the business to actually accept this slightly more complicated process to how to calculate metrics than what they tend to be used to. Because PMs understand how to do something in SQL, when you talk to them about maximum likelihood estimation and derived metrics, or we call them modeled metrics, then sort of like it gets a bit more difficult. But if you then talk money, they, they listen again. Sorry, there was somebody in the, in the back that has been trying to answer, ask a question for a while now. Okay, so the question here is, is one about how we interpret what it means to be a user. Uh, phones are easy to pass around, and um, I think the example mentioned here was like, even though the gentleman might have the account, it might be his partner or some family member that actually ends up using the app, and then sort of like, we think the person likes one thing, and then there's this odd order of something else that totally throws up our recommender system. Um, that's actually really hard, exactly because you can pass phones around, um, uh, that we've not, well, that's a really hard problem. Um, uh, again, one of those problems that don't necessarily affect the model as much as everything we do at a user level, like what does it mean to be a user? Um, for the most part, we assume a user is, a, is an account ID. Me joining Deliveroo was excellent for my family because my wife stopped ordering and then she started getting all those vouchers. Not that we, like, well, I wasn't above not using them. So uh, that was pretty good for us. Um, uh, same happened when we, well, anyways, different story. But, but yeah, that's actually a tricky business no matter what you want to do. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question, maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's a very nice question. So how would you do that? Um, you would parameterize R alpha A and B. So instead of saying something like this is simply B, you would make B a function of stuff. And then you would put that in there. So, so any additional features are most easily accommodated through those parameters. Actually, it's only 
It's only three of them because the other two would wash out. Um, that, that it wouldn't be identified. But it's, it's that how you can do this. And um, uh, it gets all a bit more complicated. Um, uh, you can still solve that. And, and uh, it's actually quite useful for certain things. Like going back to the question about plus, we did do something like that at some point. We featureized it by saying, well, this guy's a plus person and this person is not. Um, and then saw the differences in parameters for plus versus non plus people. A problem with this, if you wanted to do this with this model, is that this one only allows you to uh, look at user specific features. They need to be constant over your observation period. So you can't have somebody be plus for half of the sample and not be plus for the other half of the sample. That switch would be, would be really hard to accommodate. Because now the, and, and the reason why that is has to do with the fact that, or rather, well, it has to do with the exponential distribution. The benefit we get is we don't need to account for where we're in data side. Right. The benefit we get from ignoring this is that we only need to worry about when you made your last observation. If we wanted to do customer, excuse me, observation specific, uh, order specific features, we'd have to keep track of all orders and when they happened. And um, that gets a lot more complicated. Uh, again. Might be worth, depending on your use case, but we haven't found, or at least we haven't reached that use case, yes. Yeah. Matthias, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, round of applause for Matthias, please.